On the frigid cold morning of November 2nd, 1806, the first French troops crossed the border from Brandenburg into Poland. They were the dragoons of General Marc Antoine Beaumont's division. In German, the region they entered was designated as Posen, after its major city, Poznan, in Polish. Screened by Beaumont's dragoons, Nicolas de Vaux's corps was not far behind. Aside from the poor quality of the roads, the French advanced quickly, reaching Poznan on the 5th. Ecstatic locals were eager to welcome their liberators, offering gratitude and goodwill. More helpfully, the Poles then confirmed that between Poznan and Warsaw was not a single Prussian unit. The Russians, though, were another matter entirely. Reports provided by scouts and a network of spies revealed that the main Russian army of 56,000 troops had departed Grodno in late October. It was plain to Napoleon and his staff that the Russians would attempt to link up with their Prussian allies. At the moment, the Prussian army was moving southeast out of East Prussia towards the ancient city of Torn, so it was a safe bet that this was where the Russians too were heading. For Napoleon, a new rapid campaign was thus imperative to thwart the conjunction of the two enemy armies. Organising that new campaign would be a little tricky though. In early November, La Grande Armée was strung out on operations all throughout Brandenburg, Pomerania and Westphalia. Thus only four of nine corps were available for immediate operations, those which had been pre-positioned in or around Brandenburg and Pomerania. Nicolas de Vaux's corps had of course gone ahead with the main force and liberated Poznan. With the help of Polish patriots, they now set about turning the province into a staging ground for the rest of the French army. Bakeries, hospitals and depots were established while scouts went ahead to reconnoitre. Making first use of these new facilities was Jean Lannes, in command of 5th Corps, who departed Berlin on November 9th. Together, he and de Vaux would form the centre of the advance. Lannes would strike northeast towards Torn, while de Vaux would drive directly east for Warsaw. To screen the central push was Pierre Augereau, in command of 7th Corps. Advancing out of Stettin, he would trace the Vistula River south until he reached Torn, where Rapone joined Lannes and take the city. Though the path was relatively clear for de Vaux and Lannes, Augereau might well run into some resistance from the commander of Prussian forces in the area, Anton von Letouk. Despite his French name, Letouk was every inch a model Prussian officer, stern, brave and committed to the king. He had under his command all that could be mustered out of East Prussia, about 20,000 troops, now down to about 15 or 16,000, owing to the need to garrison forts and towns. On his own, Letouk could not hope to defeat an entire French corps, but he might at least delay one until a Russian army arrived from his east. And that army was on its way. Though technically under the command of Marshal Mikhail Kaminskoy, General August von Benningsen took tactical command with a forward division, sent ahead of the main force to defend the Vistula. A second Russian army under Marshal Friedrich Wilhelm von Duxhoven was also amassing out east as reinforcements. Screening the entire French advance from the south was a member of the imperial family, Jérôme Bonaparte, Napoleon's youngest brother. A sailor by trade, if not by disposition, Jérôme had no place leading soldiers into battle, being both too young and completely without even the most rudimentary experience in command. The appointment was entirely venal, fitting into Napoleon's grander dynastic ambitions, but not completely devoid of military sense. Ninth Corps was composed exclusively from the German divisions provided by France's German allies and client states. Operations were therefore managed by the most senior of the German commanders, the Bavarians Karl Philipp von Weide and Gerhard von der Roy. Since October, Ninth Corps had been operating in Silesia, capturing Prussian towns and forts one by one. The military necessity of this operation was minimal since the Prussians weren't likely to rally a defence out of rugged Silesia. Instead, the true purpose was to interpose a French force between the Austrians and Poland. Alongside the big push, 9th Corps was to move from Glogau to Kalisz, Kalisz in Polish. This would make the Austrians think twice about joining the 4th Coalition. 9th Corps would be in a perfect position to strike into Austrian-controlled Poland, a region called Volhynia, and liberate it to Poland. Completing the stranglehold on the Austrians, Auguste Malmont's 2nd Corps stationed in Dalmatia, would be halfway to Vienna before any Austrian declaration of war had even reached Paris. Given the wide frontage of the advance and the lack of clear information on exact enemy positions, the Vistula campaign would be spearheaded by a wave of cavalry to act as both scouts and a vanguard. So who better to lead them than the commander of the reserve cavalry division, Joachim Marat? 
The mission could have been purpose-built to suit his preferences. A broad front advanced against a foe enshrouded in the fog of war. Morale was in heaven. Of the 80,000 troops in the first wave, 15,000 were light cavalry alone. The heavier horse units, the cuirassiers and garde à cheval, remained in reserve in Berlin under Jean-Baptiste Bessières. It was also in Berlin that Napoleon stayed because, as we've seen, November was a very busy one for him indeed. War would not wait for matters of state, and it was here that he promulgated the Berlin Decrees and juggled relations with allies and enemies. On top of these duties, Napoleon and his staff directed the logistical preparations for the invasion of Poland. Supply depots in the rear lines were chock full of ammunition and food, which was then carted to the front. Horses, always in short supply, were requisitioned from Germany and Italy, even if it meant dismounting entire units. Issues that would have passed by any lesser leader were closely managed by Napoleon. Reports from the front complained about a deficit of about 600,000 boots, one replacement for every soldier and one spare. While the manufactories churned out boots as fast as possible, as an exigency, Napoleon had the disarmed Prussian cavalry donate their boots to their French counterparts. Straight cash was also procured by hook or crook. The Confederation of the Rhine contributed millions of francs for the campaign, and a special levy was foisted upon the major independent trading towns, namely Bremen and Hamburg. It was not without good reason that Napoleon devoted so much time to logistics. Despite its reputation as the breadbasket of Europe, Poland's recent despoilation and partition had left entire fields untended. La Grande Armée's usual policy of living off the land would be mostly impossible. Navigation too was complicated. Poland was a land of forests, marshes and fields. Apart from the few large towns and cities, only poor villages dotted the landscape. The road network too was atrocious. Carts had to traverse long and unpaved dirt roads that were quickly overflowing with traffic. Half the tracks were unmarked anyway, forcing commanders to send scouts to map out the roads. Poor weather and plummeting temperatures exacerbated these issues. Through November, the rain was incessant. On every road, a miasmic, gelatinous mud made progress agonizingly slow. Wagons floundered in the muck. Horses sank up to their fetlocks. Napoleon's friend and member of staff, Claude de Roc, even shattered his collarbone when his cart overturned. The soldiers quipped that there existed five elements. Water, fire, earth, air, and mud. Predictably then, supply shortfall afflicted the entire advance, and to a degree La Grande Armée had never suffered before. Reports from the front back to Napoleon made constant mention of demoralisation among the troops, who were tired, exhausted, and up to the ankles in mud. It was at this point that Napoleon took to calling his soldiers les grognards, the groaners or the complainers. He meant the term for the army as a whole, but it would gradually be adopted as a point of pride for the Imperial Guard, for whom it showed that they had the Emperor's ear. Attempts to improve the soldiers' lot were forthcoming. In November, Napoleon doubled the pay rate for all troops, for what it was worth. A hungry soldier can't eat his pay. For some soldiers, it was all too much, and officers reported a spate of suicides and desertions. Despite drooping morale and supply shortfall, the French advance did make decent enough progress. In the centre, Davou was nearing Warsaw. The only contact made with the enemy occurred on November 28th on the approach to Warsaw. Benningsen's force was parked nearby, but rather than attempt to hold the Vistula against Marat's cavalry, he retreated after a few tiny skirmishes. Before he pulled back, however, Benningsen vandalised the suburb of Praga and demolished the bridges over the Vistula. He then retreated north to Pultusk, joining the main army there. Jaron, meanwhile, had taken Calais without issue and established a French presence near Volhynia. Orgeron and Lannes' advance encountered some resistance from the Prussians on approach to Torn. The city and its formidable fortress fell on December 4th, at which point Le Touc fell back east to Lautenburg. By December 6th, then, the opening vistula phase of the Polish campaign was complete. La Grande Armée was now arrayed along the entire length of the Vistula River. On November 25th, at the same time Marat was chasing Benningsen from Warsaw, Napoleon departed Berlin for the front lines. He quit the Prussian capital before dawn to hoodwink any spies, and then followed the roads leading east into Poland. This was Napoleon's first time seeing Poland, a land whose people and history he'd heard a great deal about. He took a keen interest in the topography, the climate, local demographics, 
and insisted that scouts sign their name to report so that he could call upon them directly to answer any of the questions he had. After two days on the road, Napoleon then entered the recently liberated Poznan to a hero's welcome. People mobbed the emperor as his coach trundled into town. A delegation of the city's elite were the first to welcome the French to Poland officially. Though Napoleon did refuse to pursue Polish independence then and there, despite the best efforts of Poznan city leaders, they would offer their assistance. Poland was declared to be in a state of insurrection, the call to arms reverberating throughout the land. After staying a few days, Napoleon was again on the road heading to Warsaw. Conditions were, as we've seen, deplorable, as the roads were churned into mud. Ditching the coach, which was often stuck in the mud, Napoleon rode instead on horseback. Along the way, he visited every regiment and inspected every depot he could. The old soldier and Napoleon didn't pass up the opportunity to be among the soldiers whenever the chance arose. He chat with them, offering advice and reassurance, laughing at their jokes. As is often the case in tough times, the soldiers used a dark humour to make light of the situation. They joked that for a Frenchman, there were only a few words they needed in Polish. Kleba, where's the bread? Niema, there is none. Wota, any water? Sana, plenty. Some interactions were not so pleasant though. Passing a column of shivering, hungry fantasin, one demanded of Napoleon as he passed by, quote, Have you been hit in the head, leading us to starve on the roads like this? Napoleon's response came in turn, quote, Give me four more days of patience, then I won't ask any more of you. You'll be cantoned. Unsatisfied, the soldier warned Napoleon that he better keep his promise, otherwise the army would, quote, canton itself. In any other army of the period, such a stark threat of mutiny, directed at the commander-in-chief and head of state, no less, would have been punished with a short drop from a long rope. But Napoleon would not punish outbursts like this. The plain humble directness of the French soldier was something he was used to and even respected. Where Napoleon's problems were with supply and morale, the Russians were facing grave issues at the strategic level. The failure to defend Warsaw and the Vistula against the approaching Grand Armée induced panic in the Russian command. At the very top was Marshal Mikhail Kaminskoy, infamous for both a foul temper and stubbornness. Acceptable traits though these might be for a divisional leader, Kaminskoy was head of the combined Russian army in Poland. Ironically, despite being a hothead, in personal command he was indecisive and overcautious. All in all a bad pick for a commander. The army he commanded was split into two forces under commanders we've met before. General August von Benigsen was in command of the larger portion at around 65 to 67,000. The orders to abandon Warsaw did not sit well with Benigsen, though he followed them dutifully to take up a position in Pultusk. Here he was to await the army of Marshal Friedrich Wilhelm von Buxhoeven. With an additional 46,000 troops, Buxhoeven was making for Pultusk too, but in no hurry. Buxhoeven hated Benigsen. He was out of favour at court, while Benningsen hated Buxhoeven for dropping the ball at Austerlitz. This function and animosity at the highest levels of Russian command played directly into French hands, as no clear defensive strategy was devised in time to counter Napoleon's next move. As he approached the front lines in mid-December, Napoleon assumed a direct command. Marat returned to his usual role as commander of the reserve cavalry. In this capacity, he was ordered to range north over the Vistula towards Pultusk, clearing the way for a general advance by the corps of Ney, Bernadotte, Lan, and Soule. It was expected that every bridge, every ford over the rivers Narev, Bug, and Ukra would be well defended by Benningsen's troops. However, Marat reported minimal contact with only a few units of Cossacks over the next few days. A few intrepid French units made it as far as Pultusk, where they spied Benningsen in the midst of a withdrawal north. The wavering Kaminskoy was fearful that the expected French thrust would be impossible to hold, despite Benningsen's excellent position at the fulcrum between the Bug and Narev. Instead, he was ordered north towards Makov, where he would meet Buxhoeven halfway. Piecing together Kaminskoy's intentions from disparate reports, Napoleon ordered that the general advance be launched immediately, even without infantry or artillery support. Christmas had come early for Marat. Reinforced by the light units of Bessier's guard, and the cavalry brigades of the three corps, Marat had 30,000 horsemen ready for the off, scheduled for December 18th. Already pre-positioned, squadrons of hussars and dragoons made rapid progress northwards, striking deep behind enemy lines. Contact was heavier than expected, 
Boxer Dunan and Benningsen had been able to complete their juncture at Makov, whereupon Benningsen did a complete 180 and marched back south the way he'd come. In so doing, the bulk of the combined Russian army was now running into Marat's marauding cavalry. Fighting was frequent and intense with mobile French cavalry, waging a borderline guerrilla war against the much larger enemy force. However, unsupported by the big guns and foot soldiers of the corps, the Russians could not be prevented from reoccupying Pultusk on December 20th. From here, Benningsen's units fanned out to defend the river crossings abandoned in the days before. Delayed by the poor Polish infrastructure and heavy snowfall, the advance of Ney and Sul didn't make the progress needed. The Ukra held firm against the assaults of Sul for two full days. Instead, it was Davout's corps that made the vital breakthrough over the river Nadev at the town of Tsarnovo. For the entire day of the 22nd, Davout's troops braved Russian fire and heavy snow to make their crossing. Unable to hold, the Russians fell back to Nasielsk, allowing Davu to form a bridgehead. Throughout the 23rd, more fierce fighting erupted all along the line. Benningsen fought hard to eject Davu, but Lance Corps by now had moved up to reinforce him. With Davu holding Benningsen at Nasielsk, Lan marched east along the Narev, aiming to capture Pultusk. Again, owing to the weather and strong resistance, the going was slow for the French, measured in miles a day, not miles an hour. Though concerned by the slow progress, Napoleon was still confident that it was only a matter of time before Kaminskoy ordered a fuller retreat. A secondary attack had been launched on the 20th in conjunction with the main northward thrust. Marching eastward out of Torn, Bernadotte and Ney reached Birshun on the 23rd. There they engaged Le Turk and elements of the Russian army. No breakthrough was achieved, but Kaminskoy was still spooked that if not held, two French corps would be between him and the Prussians. He therefore ordered a fuller retreat on the 24th. Under cover of darkness, Benningsen retired from Naskielsk and the Ukra. But his movements were spotted by the French cavalry, still operating all throughout the Russian rear. This information was relayed to Napoleon, who ordered a general advance the same night. Christmas Day was therefore one of particularly sharp action as the French army rumbled forward. Not that all was going well for Napoleon, though. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, The weather again slowed the French right down. Entire regiments were stranded in the snow, their supplies strung out on clogged roads. All of this allowed Benningsen to withdraw in good order. He resumed a strong defence at Pultusk in time to repel Lannes on the 26th. The Battle of Pultusk was a mixed success for the French. Lannes outnumbered troops took the town centre in the morning, but lost it in the afternoon. Not helping matters was a driving snowstorm that swept across the battlefield, reducing visibility to near zero. The action would have been indecisive had it not been for Davout's action to the northwest at Gullimin. The advance guard of Buxhoven's army, led by Prince Andrei Galitsyn, was attacked unexpectedly. But through a pasty defences in the town centre, just before Davout's corps launched an enveloping attack, elements of Augereau's corps, sent up as reinforcements, then flanked around. They were amazed to see columns of Russian infantry marching out of Gullimin under horrendous fire, never returning a shot of their own. Despite inflicting terrible losses, the French were unable to close the gap and crush the Russians owing to deplorable conditions. Jean Rapp later recorded of the battle that entire French units were bogged down in the mud, the plumed shakos of the officers serving as ranging markers for Russian Jaegers. Rapp himself would take a wound to the arm, his ninth in the line of duty. Russian stragglers held out in Gulliman town, which was only taken after a final bloody assault that saw around a thousand dead and wounded on both sides. Bucks Hervden's defeated Gulli Min broke what little there was of Kaminskoy's nerve. He ordered a full retreat on the 26th. Benningsen was unusually of the same mind and had retired from Pultusk that same night under cover of darkness. The Russian line of retreat took them northeast along the Narev River towards Ostralanka. Every step of the way, Morale's cavalry harassed and harried them. Messier's boys got stuck in too, plunging east along the southern side of the Narev in an attempt to cut Benningsen off. From his forward position, riding from corps to corps, Napoleon expected to face stiff resistance at Makov, a town and bridge on the crossing of the river Ozyk. Unsupported, his cavalry would be minced, so he ordered Marat and Bessier to halt and await the infantry from the main corps. And I really am a broken record now because, yes, the weather delayed the corps by days. Reports from the time recalled bone-chilling nights so cold that soldiers, carts and horses were frozen in place by morning. Then, as the day's sun shone, the recently iced over ground would thaw and produce more viscous mud. From December 26th to the 28th, 
The infantry and their cannons barely made seven miles from the battlefields at Gulimin and Poltusk. Even at twice this pace, it would have been too late to catch the Russians, who passed through Makov without pause. So it was that any further advance for the French was now not only impossible, but pointless. Kiminskoy had escaped. This brief little campaign within a campaign is now known as the Maneuver on the Narev. Despite promising to inflict, quote, another Austerlitz in the heart of Prussia, the campaign was far from Napoleon's finest. Military historian David Chandler criticises Napoleon's dispersal of his corps, which were not within mutually supportive distance and so not able to replicate Austerlitz at Poltusk or Gulimin. Ultimately, though, the weather had fatally undermined the manoeuvre on the Narev. Napoleon clearly underestimated just how disruptive the cold and bad weather would be on operations, and not for the last time. Bearing the brunt of adverse conditions were, of course, the soldiers of La Grande Armée. For a first-hand account, we can turn to an officer of the 40th Regiment of the Line, Dominique François Hinal. A native of Normandy, Hinal wrote home every few months to his wife, Rosalie Passelet, providing a snapshot into life on the front. On the 7th of January 1807, he wrote from Warsaw, My dear friend, I can already hear you saying why didn't I write to you immediately about my promotion to sous-lieutenant? Listen and see well that I paid dearly for the fruits of my rank. At midday on December 26th, our division went forward to join the Russian army at Pultusk. A few days before, the Russians had been flushed from a strong position on a river, but here they were in force and on good ground, while our troops were knee-high in mud. The fire began, the enemy was superior in strength. The division's inability to conduct manoeuvres in such bad terrain made us endure the enemy's fire without moving. One of the regiments, unable to form squares in the mud, suffered an enemy cavalry charge. On conditions more generally, in our route, it is impossible to convey an idea of the mud and bad weather. We were days in bivouac without straw, without bread, in the mud. Men remained stuck in the mud, unable to get out. Others died of cold and weakness because it had been three days since we received any bread. Poland could not support us as wherever the Russians pass, they loot and steal and burn what they cannot take. We are back now in Warsaw, the misery felt by large numbers of the troops. I hope that during the transfer of weapons to the regiment, there will be arrangements for me to return to France. Adieu, my tender Rosalie. I kiss you a thousand times and a thousand times more. I am yours until my last breath. Sous-Lieutenant Inau's experience on the ground was hardly unique. The strategic picture was a little more hopeful, though. Despite the failure to ensnare and crush Kaminskoy, Napoleon had still succeeded in extending his control beyond Warsaw and the Vistula. When he called for the troops to take up winter quarters on December 28th, La Grande Armée occupied an excellent defensive line along the Vistula and the Narev rivers. Bernadotte's first corps was positioned between Lobau and Ostorowenka. To his southeast was Ney's sixth corps, positioned at Niedenburg and Janova, at the origin of the Ozietz, the northernmost tributary of the Narev. Murat's reserve cavalry were arrayed along the Ozietz from Janova to about Makov to act as a tripwire for any Russian funny business that winter. Behind the three advanced corps was the rest of La Grande Armée. Pultusk was rapidly built up into a new centre of operations, guarded on the flanks by Orgero's 7th Corps in Plonsk, Sol's 4th Corps at Makov, and Davout's 3rd Corps at Brock. In reserve in Warsaw was Lance's 5th Corps and the Imperial Guard. To top it all off, a new corps was formed for the sole purpose of reducing the city of Danzig. 10th Corps, comprised of 25,000 troops formed from reinforcements from France, was initially to be commanded by General Claude Victor. He began the opening phase of the siege, but was captured in the process by Prussian partisans. General François Joseph Lefebvre then took command of 10th Corps and the siege of Danzig. We might also take a quick look at the Russian side of things. At a compositional level, the Russian army was still about the same as it had been in 1805, and possessed of excellent artillery and cavalry. What had changed was the leadership. It was not lost on Kaminskoy, Buxhoven, or Bennigsen how eerily similar this campaign had been to the disastrous Austerlitz campaign nearly exactly one year ago, December of 1805. Bennigsen did about as well as he could under the circumstances. It's Kaminskoy that deserves blame for the Russian defeat. His order for Bennigsen to abandon forward positions to join Buxhoven ruined any hope of a successful defence from day one. Kaminskoy's days in charge were numbered as Bennigsen eyed the top job. 
both the French and Russians would have plenty of time to reflect on their mistakes. This winter was a particularly cold one and promised to last for several weeks more at least, well into the new year. Returning from the front lines, Napoleon entered Warsaw on January 1st, 1807. It was not technically his first time here. He'd briefly passed through on December 19th on his way to the front lines, but this was certainly his first official visit to the Polish capital. Napoleon would stay for exactly one month, a winter in Warsaw. All in all, Napoleon was very impressed by what he saw. Warsaw itself was a relatively new capital, most of its major civic buildings and spaces having only been built in the last few decades. The architecture was very clearly inspired by the best of both France and Italy, while the open gardens recalled Berlin's majestic Tiergarten. Reception, balls and soirees were held in Napoleon's honour, marking the first official gatherings of the Polish nobility since the partition of Poland. No expense was spared, and it did have the desired effect of making a favourable impression. All the Polish nobles were francophone and enthusiastic about resuming the advance come spring. It also helped that the Warsaw Opera was of excellent quality, and Napoleon attended regular performances for the duration of his stay. Overall, then, it's fair to say his mood was very good, not in the least because on these cold winter nights, his bed was very warm. The last we looked at Napoleon's love life was back in December 1804, and the months-long affair with the mysterious Madame F., She was not the first, nor was she the last of Napoleon's mistresses. It's safe to presume that between then and 1807, there were dozens of dalliances, trysts and affairs with at least as many women. All, of course, were well hidden from Empress Josephine, not that she wasn't aware. From her friends, from informers, or more usually through gossip, she learned of her husband's infidelity. And though the thought of them, and so many of them, pained Josephine, She understood that on some level this was Napoleon's revenge for the early years of their marriage, when she'd been distant, promiscuous, and of course carried away by the dashing young Hippolyte Charles. By 1807 those days were all in the past. Napoleon and Josephine had long since reconciled. Their relationship now was entirely different. Unlike in their early years where Josephine was dominant, now Napoleon was indisputably in charge of their marriage. At the end of the day, Josephine needed him more than he needed her, the power and balance suiting Napoleon perfectly. He didn't need to fear Josephine straying or trying to undermine him, since she relied entirely upon him for position, wealth, and for patronage for her children. In return, Napoleon gained a wife who was a model empress. Kind, social, a pillar of legitimacy for the regime. Though this might have been a relationship with a strong transactional character, we mustn't forget that at its base was a genuine love. A love that was sometimes hot, sometimes cold, and always complicated. When first they met, Napoleon was struck by Josephine's dignity and beauty. That love had now matured. Josephine was now his companion, a soulmate. She was affable, thoughtful, graceful, and a great comfort both in person and as a correspondent. For her part, Josephine's love had matured too. Spurned by Parisian high society as a creole, abused by a lecherous husband, Imprisoned during the revolution, used and tossed aside after it, Josephine's life until she met Napoleon had lacked stability and surety. Now she had it for herself and her children, and could look to Napoleon as the reason. Perhaps this was the main reason Josephine did love Napoleon, because he'd adopted Eugène and Hortense as his own, doted upon them, granting them titles and honours. At times, Josephine has been given a hard time for this, accused of cynicism and disloyalty. It's said that she loved Napoleon merely because it was convenient, because it was safe. Well, if that's so, let Napoleon be cast with the same brush. He would not have married Josephine when they met, no matter how infatuated he was, if she was not politically useful. And he would not have stayed married to her, made her an empress, if she was not, in a very pragmatic sense, a political asset. In a few years, we'll see Napoleon cast Josephine aside, just as soon as it was convenient for him. For all the love there was in this marriage, there were some things Napoleon couldn't get from Josephine. Whether they were together or apart, Napoleon conducted numerous affairs, sometimes two at a time, but usually confined to a given city or region. The exact circumstances varied, especially with location, but the women in question were always beautiful, introduced to him, not sought out, and young, varying from 17 to their mid-twenties. Most were flings in one-night stands, but a few made a lasting impression. Madame F, back at Bologna, shared Napoleon's attentions with actress Marie-Thérèse Bourgeois. 
In a similar vein was Giuseppe Grassini in 1805, an Italian opera singer who infatuated Napoleon. Well, only weeks after that torrid affair and another in Genoa, Napoleon was on to a week-long tryst with Marie Lovat, a Lyonnaise heiress. On returning to Paris, he then resumed his months-long affair with Adèle Duchatel, the wife of a government minister. We can imagine the sly looks at council meetings. In early 1806, whilst digging into affairs of state, Napoleon sought distraction in Eleanor du Nord de la Plaine, one of his sister Caroline's friends. Far from coy about these dalliances, Napoleon did only the barest minimum to keep them secret. In fact, bribes and gifts to the mistresses were considered household expenses, and on them he spent tens of thousands of francs from state funds. 24,000 francs alone went to a mistress surreptitiously listed only as La Belle Genovese. There was an ulterior motive to Napoleon's affairs, beyond his short-term satisfaction. Worry about the lack of an imperial heir was now becoming acute, so Napoleon was all too happy to have it known, on the down low of course, that all the crown jewels were in order. He had for certain one illegitimate child before 1806 with Eleanor. Though Napoleon maintained, in person and in private, his love for Josephine, the Empress certainly felt the need to be by her husband's side. During the War of the Fourth Coalition, she'd followed in the wake of the army, enjoying the hospitality of the cities of the Confederation of the Rhine. There was no complaint from Napoleon, who reveled in having his closest confidant closer by, and so contactable by letter within days rather than weeks. Each letter remained as intimate and as revealing as they'd always done. When in Guerra on the morning of October 13th, 1806, Napoleon confided, I am at Guerra, my dear friend. I am wonderfully well, fatter than when I started, and yet I make 20 or 25 leagues a day on horseback, by carriages, all sorts of ways. I go to bed at 8 to awake at midnight. It sometimes occurs to me that you haven't even gone to bed yet. To sign off the letter, Napoleon etched tout à toi, always yours, just one of the many he liked to use. Letters to Josephine were not merely stress relief for Napoleon, but a way for him to sound out private political thoughts with a trusted confidant. For instance, Queen Louise of Prussia was a topic of discussion for many letters written whilst Napoleon was campaigning against Prussia. As one of the movers and shakers in the war camp advising King Friedrich Wilhelm, Napoleon had practical political reasons to be averse to the Queen, but his aversion had a deeper pathology. Letters to Josephine were tainted by shades of misogyny, as he accused Louise of duplicity and perfidy, and claimed that these traits were detestable in women. Against these accusations, Josephine rose to Louis' defence. Napoleon responded on November 6 that yes, he did, quote, hate intriguing women, but only because he was accustomed to those who were, quote, soft and amiable, women who were, in his mind, like Josephine. This little exchange is more revealing about Napoleon's views on women rather than his relationship with Josephine, though it did have some lasting impact. When he was invaded by Princess Caroline Auguste of mecklenburg strelitz the duchy from where Queen Louise hailed, Napoleon promised leniency, Josephine's words quite possibly ringing in his ears. With the war moving into Poland, Napoleon was insistent that Josephine get to Berlin as soon as was practicable. From Poznan, he kept her up to date about his day-to-day and about nature of life in Poland. Josephine seemed to have some romantic notion that it was a land of milk and honey. Napoleon was quick to confirm that it wasn't quite so rosy, mentioning the rain and deteriorating weather constantly. Josephine also inquired about Polish high society and about their enthusiasm for the French, all of which Napoleon answered in his replies. It's clear from the tone that they were both longing to be together, though for Josephine the need was more acute. She had strong suspicions that Napoleon was not so lonely as he let on, declaring that she heard Polish women were some of the most beautiful in the world and so he must be tempted by them. He assured her, quote, You exaggerate the attractiveness of the beauties of Poland. A bit mischievously, though, Napoleon did play to Josephine's jealousy. Today is the anniversary of Austerlitz. I have been to a ball. It was raining. I am well. I love and want you. All the Polish women speak French, but there is only one woman in the world for me. Do you know her, by chance? I could draw her portrait but I should have to flatter her too much before you would recognise her. Truth be told, my heart could only find nice things to say about you. These solitary nights are very long. Josephine was right to be worried about the beauties of Poland. Returning from a tour of the battlefield at Pultusk on January 1st, Napoleon and his entourage briefly stopped in the town of Blogny. 
as ever the local elite turned out to greet the emperor. And amidst the usual fare of local administrators, magnates and notables, was a lady of singular grace. She was Marie Wonchiska, a 20-year-old mother of two. Hailing from an old aristocratic clan, she'd married Count Athanasius Colonna Velevska. She was therefore introduced to Napoleon as Countess Marie Colonna Velevska. And from the very first second of this chance meeting, the emperor was spellbound. The day after, Marie was slipped a note requesting her attendance at a ball in Warsaw. A quick call, the note read, will quiet the impatient ardour of N. Where in weeks past Napoleon had insisted Josephine make haste to Berlin, he now protested that it was unsafe. The Empress was of course gobsmacked at this shameless about face. She fought her case, but Napoleon's decision was final. I have received your letter, dear Josephine. Your disappointment touches me, but one must submit to circumstance. It is a very great distance from Mainz to Warsaw. Events will permit me to return to Berlin before I write to you to join me there. I am inclined to think you are better off in Paris, where your presence is necessary. I am well. The weather is wretched. The reason for Napoleon's change of mind was obvious to Josephine, though she was helpless to change it. In the meantime, Marie had not yet answered Napoleon's request. He'd sent more, not request this time, but please. Quote, You have deprived me of sleep. Grant a little joy, a little happiness to a heart which is ready to adore you. A few days later, on January 12th, quote, All your wishes shall come true, and your country would be more dear to me if you take compassion on my poor heart. It was only after this latest, desperate, mewling plea that Marie did answer. Clearly, she had cunning enough to match her looks. Only at a ball on the night of January 14th did Napoleon and Marie meet a second time. In full view of Warsaw, the two danced, the implications unmistakable. Without question, rumours would worm their way back to Paris, to the Empress, but Napoleon didn't care. He was obsessed. The morning after their evening together, he wrote to Marie professing that she was his, quote, first thought, his first wish. Tellingly, she was also addressed by the informal too, a distinction otherwise reserved for Josephine. The Empress, though not clear in the specifics of the affair, was aware that something was up and insisted upon getting to Warsaw. Napoleon rebuffed her not only quickly, but cruelly. It is out of the question that I should allow you to take such a journey. Bad roads, unsafe conditions, and marshes too. Return to Paris. Be happy. Perhaps I shall be back myself. Goodbye, my dear friend. You had best believe that I regret not being able to send for you. Say to yourself, here is proof of how precious I am to him. To use the modern term, Napoleon was gaslighting Josephine. Marie, he deemed, was worth it. Their relationship flourished for the month they spent together in Warsaw. Clandestine meetings took place between public appearances. It's clear that Napoleon got from Marie everything he could have wanted and more. But what did Marie see in Napoleon? Not a consummate lover, that's for sure. One of Napoleon's aides in the know once remarked that, like all things, the emperor took sex very seriously, and the matter was, quote, closed in three minutes or less. That being so, there was a certain connection for Marie. For all his faults, Napoleon was a pleasant man in intimate surrounds, freed from the expectations of his office. He was a good listener and enjoyed long conversations. It's impossible to know, but certainly seems plausible, that Marie steered some of these questions in the direction of Poland and what came next, a question that was, as we'll get to soon, dominating Napoleon's day-to-day. What was said by the fireside or in the afterglow is anyone's guess, but it is for sure that Napoleon was firmly under Marie's influence. She was not merely a fling and a fair, nor even a mistress. She was a companion, a flame. There was love there, and it would stand the test of time. By night with Marie, by day in the Warsaw Royal Palace, Napoleon was a busy man indeed. With the army at winter quarters and fresh supplies and reinforcements being brought to the front, Military affairs were on the back burner. As mentioned, the future of Poland was what focused Napoleon's attentions. For two decades now, the question of what France was to make of Poland was a dormant one, and even now that it had been asked, the answer was far from straightforward. At the end of the last episode, we had a brief squiz at the complexities of this question, and while the information there is all still accurate, it's not the full picture. And this is where I tell you it's important for us to have a fuller grasp on Polish history to truly appreciate what's going to happen to Poland in the Napoleonic age, 
but that's not really true. I just feel like doing some Polish history, and since I'm driving, I get to pick the music. So, our sojourn begins in the city of Lublin in 1569, where the kingdoms of Poland and Lithuania formally merged into a single entity, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The Commonwealth was quite unlike any other state in Europe, successfully combining the institutions of monarchy and republic. The king, for example, was elected, and the nobility, Szlachta in Polish, were able to vote in regional assemblies called Siemik, which then appointed members to a national assembly, a Siem. The Commonwealth weathered the storm of the 16th and 17th centuries quite commendably, all things considered. Only in the 1700s did the ship of state start to take on water. Politically, the Commonwealth valued their constitutionalism and noble institutions, even when these had become vectors of foreign meddling. Much has been made of the infamous Liberum Veto, by which even a single dissenting vote in the Siem could veto any proposal. In truth, the Liberum Veto was rarely invoked, though it existed as a kind of ever-present threat. The more traditional fields of bribery and corruption were what paralysed lawmaking. This state of affairs served to keep the Commonwealth artificially weak, never able to develop economically, raise a significant standing army, or even effectively tax its very rich magnates and schlachter. Things came to a head in 1733 with the War of the Polish Succession, showing how invested Prussia, Russia and Austria were in maintaining the Commonwealth's impotence. They jointly agreed to support a pliant candidate in August III, a Saxon prince. Those in the Commonwealth opposed a foreign influence backed a local candidate, Stanislav I Leszczyski. Through marriage, the Leszczyski were linked to the Bourbons of France and Spain, who supported the Commonwealth in the war. But surrounded on all sides and with their allies half a continent away, the Commonwealth's fate was never in doubt. August III was installed as king, serving as a cipher for the Habsburgs. So if salvation for the Commonwealth would not come from without, it had to come from within. A homegrown reform movement sprung up among the magnates, who supported the Leszczyski claim. The Sartorsky and the Poniatowski families committed themselves to the long-term project of revitalizing the Commonwealth. The Tsiartowski pursued strong ties to Russia, leveraging the chaotic succession of Tsars and Tsarinas after the death of Peter I. The Poniatowski, meanwhile, affirmed the more traditional alliance with France. Hopes were pinned on a fine young Poniatowski son, Stanislav Poniatowski. By the age of 26, he had a first-class education, spoke six languages, had toured most of Europe, and engaged in a torrid but very sincere affair with Sophia von Anhalt Zerbst, the soon-to-be Empress of Russia. Despite Tsiartowski and Poniatowski plans to overthrow August III, Austrian support ensured he lived long enough to die of natural causes in 1763. Initially, the two families supported the candidacy of Adam Kazimir Tsiartowski for the Polish throne, though he declined. So it was that the bright Stanislav Poniatowski was duly elected as King Stanislav II. His relationship with Sophia, now Catherine II of Russia, ensured that the Commonwealth shifted further into Russia's orbit. Still, with a passionate reformer for a king, at last long dormant reforms were implemented in a slew of legislation. The Siem system was rationalised, a new legal code promulgated, the army reconstituted, and serfdom abolished. The Zyatowski family ably supported these new reforms, with Adam Kashmir shepherding the Siem through this time of change. Andrei Zamoyski, of another powerful noble clan, was made chancellor and was instrumental in the king's reforms. This was also a golden era for education, culture, and the arts. Vilnius could boast one of the finest universities in Europe, to which the universities of Poznan, Lublin, and Warsaw would soon be added. In the spirit of the times, magnates opened their private collections of art and literature to the public, thereby founding new libraries and galleries. Others sponsored great architectural works, with Warsaw in particular reimagined in splendid French and Italian Baroque style. These golden years were not to last. Russian influence was strong. So strong, in fact, that Catherine was beginning to view Poland not as a foreign nation, but as part of her extended imperial domain. Russian troops oversaw the Siem's deliberations, and when King Stanislav did anything Catherine didn't like, she greased the palms of those members of the minor Schlachter who stood to lose as state power grew. Those brief few years in which Poland was on the cusp of regeneration were shuddered in 1767 when Catherine imposed upon Stanislav the five eternal guarantees. On pain of war, the veto was to be protected, as were the ancient privileges of the nobility. That meant that any further reforms were off the table. 
Quite unfairly, King Stanislav was now viewed as a traitor, since he'd bowed to the inevitability of Russian pressure. A rebellion from various disaffected Shlakta clans like the Potoki, Rajiwil, Polaski, Krasinski, and Sapieha attracted foreign support from France, who sent then Colonel Francois de Maurier as an advisor. The short lived Confederation of Baal was crushed by Marshal Suvorov and the Russian army. Stanislav now ruled in disgrace. The last gasp of reform came in 1771, when Chancellor Zamoyski proposed far-reaching reforms to the Commonwealth's political system in defiance of the Five Guarantees. Threats of war came thick and fast, conclusively ending the Commonwealth's brief spell of real independence. The mere fact that Poland had, however, shown any spark of independence was of deep concern to the rulers of Prussia, Russia and Austria. Secret negotiations took place at the highest levels, wherein the fate of the Commonwealth was decided. Friedrich II of Prussia was the first to propose annexation. He hungered for the Vistula, stretching from Gdansk to Warsaw, and planned to devour Poland, quote, like an artichoke, leaf by leaf. Catherine needed little convincing. A smaller Commonwealth was a weaker Commonwealth, able to be dominated with ease. Maria Theresa of Austria was the last to join in on the plan, worrying that it would imperil relations with their ally France. But France was at this stage in a time of transition. Louis XV had died in 1770. Under the influence of his wife, Queen Marie Lesniska of Poland, Louis had been a strong supporter of the Commonwealth's independence. Under King Louis XVI, unprepared for his office, policy towards Poland was a distant concern. So by a combination of conspiracy and perfect timing, the Commonwealth was helpless as hungry neighbours carved into its flesh. Prussia seized the 36,000 square kilometres of land connecting East Prussia to Brandenburg. Russia annexed up to the river Dorgava, while Austria took Old Volhynia, renaming its capital Lvov to Lemberg. The Commonwealth had suffered a severe and ultimately irrecoverable blow, but was not crippled. The core Lithuanian, Ukrainian and Polish heartlands were largely intact, and despite being deprived of one third of their population, the Commonwealth was still a very large and populous state. It was therefore not as hard as one might expect to convince the Polish Schlachter and magnates to accept the partition. On August 5th, 1772, the partition went into effect, and but over a year later, the Siem ratified it. Russian soldiers and Austrian diplomacy ensured compliance. There was resistance, of course, The Siatorsky and Poniatowski families had never given up their dreams of reform and tried to undermine the Siem. International support was forthcoming from Great Britain and the Netherlands, who relied upon Polish grain. France too protested Poland's dismemberment. In the end, though, there was nothing serious to be done, and the Commonwealth soon acclimatised to the new status quo. Stanislav remained king under Russian protection, though he stuck to his core beliefs as a committed reformer. After years of ingratiating himself to Catherine, he managed to secure the revocation of the five eternal guarantees. Chancellor Zamoyski's political reforms were back on the table. From 1776 to 1780, he painstakingly crafted a constitution for Poland, by far the most modern in Europe until the constitutions of the French Revolution. Many other Commonwealth institutions were modernised since under foreign rule they could not be expanded. So, for instance, the national treasury became highly efficient, and most importantly for our purposes, the army reformed into a very modern force. Officer training in particular was second to none. The Polish officers who would serve with distinction in the coming Polish and French revolutions, as well as in the Napoleonic Wars, even further on into the 1820s, 30s and 40s, are all officers of this generation. In the spirit of Zamoyski's constitutionalism was a growing appreciation among the Commonwealth's elite for the Enlightenment. The Polish were particularly fascinated, paying close attention to what these Enlightenment ideas might look like in practice. We know that very similar questions are being raised in the salons and coffee houses of Paris. Poland's Enlightenment differed in that from the very beginning, it was intertwined with Polish nationalism. The idea of an independent Poland was the idea of a modern Poland. The two concepts were inextricable. It must be stressed that this was also very much a parochial sense of Polish nationalism, not Commonwealth nationalism. The Commonwealth's two other major component peoples, the Lithuanians and Ukrainians, weren't really included. The Lithuanian population was very small and its nobility generally standoffish with their Polish counterparts. 
The Ukrainians, meanwhile, had no clear path towards self-determination, and as Orthodox Christians, looked towards Kyiv and Moscow, not Warsaw, as natural benefactors. The rise in nationalism was to affect Poland's trajectory in a profound way. King Stanislav was still sucking up to Catherine, trying to secure more independence, but found the Empress less and less receptive. By 1787, it was clear to Polish reformers that Stanislav's usefulness was at an end. If Poland was to prosper, it would need to exit the Russian orbit. Increasing tensions in Europe helped here. Austria was wary of Prussian expansion, and Prussia in turn wary of Russian intentions on their eastern border. Thus, the three great powers which had carved into the Commonwealth were in a three-way standoff. Despite being the energetic instigator of the First Partition, reformers aimed to ally Poland with Prussia, capitalising on Berlin's fear of a two-front war. There was even talk of liberating Volhynia from the Austrians, a tantalising prospect for Polish nationalists. Friedrich Wilhelm II agreed to these terms, seeing the Commonwealth as a useful counterbalance to Russia and Austria, but there was no mistaking this for anything other than an alliance of convenience. Still, it provided enough diplomatic cover for the Commonwealth to pursue their own ends. In 1788, a broad tent faction, a self-styled Polish patriot movement, pushed for the convocation of a national Siem. Under the watchful eye of arch-patriot Marshal Stanislav Malachowski, patriots dominated proceedings. They rammed through a series of reforms that replaced the government with loyal members and rapidly expanded the army. Politically, it was agreed by all that the Commonwealth had to have a much stronger executive in charge of a state modelled on those centralised states of Western and Central Europe. There emerged, however, two camps on what form this should take. Hugo Kowantai, a prominent reformer, advocated a constitutional monarchy. In fact, it was something not too dissimilar to what was then being discussed in France in the opening months of the revolution, as the Estates General urged King Louis to adopt a constitution. Stanislav Stasic and Ignacy Potoki, by contrast, believed firmly that republican institutions were called for. That meant a strong Siem supported by a much broader franchise. Where the republican monarchist divide was irreconcilable in France, in the Commonwealth the accepted necessity of change dwarfed petty differences. King Stanislav endorsed the Patriots wholeheartedly and mediated between Potoki and Kohantai as they crafted a new constitution. When unveiled in May 1791, the constitution was heralded as a triumph. Though a watered-down compromise between republicanism and monarchism, the constitution was very much a reflection of the spirit of unity that animated the reform movement. Hopes abounded that perhaps again the Commonwealth was on the cusp of a new age of prosperity and progress. Again, it was not to be. The old order of Europe would soon conspire to crush the uppity Commonwealth. The first inkling of this demise came not long after the conclusion of the Commonwealth's Treaty of Alliance with Prussia in 1790. In the first partition, Prussia had not taken the extremely valuable port of Gdansk. Instead, they levied extortionate tariffs on river and traffic along the Vistula. Now, Friedrich Wilhelm II wanted Gdansk, Danzig in German, and pressured the Poles to relinquish it. Naturally, the Patriots in government and the Siem refused. At the same time as this, the utility of Poland as an ally was expended. Leopold II, replacing Joseph, struck a conciliatory posture with the Prussians in order to enlist them to fight the nascent French Republic. But it was to be Russia that brought about the ruin of the Commonwealth. Catherine had never liked the Poles, the Lithuanians, the Ukrainians, and needed little excuse to trample them to dust. More concretely though, she abhorred the collapse of Russian influence after the victory of the Patriots in 1788. Upon the pretext of supporting Polish conservatives exiled in St. Petersburg, Catherine ordered an invasion of the Commonwealth on the 14th of May 1791, about the same time Poland was erupting in celebration for their new constitution. Barely had the festivities ended when the army was called to service and new regiments hastily raised. The odds were stacked against the Commonwealth. Ruthenia and Lithuania were quickly overrun, meaning that most military resources now had to be drawn from Poland itself. Prussia, though concerned by the war, accepted Catherine's bullshit that this was technically a domestic Polish affair, to which she was simply lending aid to a legitimate rebellion. Besides, Friedrich Wilhelm was already committed to its Western Front against the French. So Poland would go it alone. 45,000 troops against 100,000. But as I mentioned before, the Polish officers were nothing to scoff at. King Stanislav's nephew, Józef Antoni Poniatowski, 
was made Commander-in-Chief of Polish forces. A skilled and experienced leader, Poniatowski led the Polish army in a successful strategic withdrawal through Ruthenia against overwhelming force. At the Battle of Zilentia on June 18th, Poniatowski bloodied the Russian nose with a skillful counterattack. A month later, Tadeusz Kosciuszko, a veteran of the American Revolutionary War and a hardcore revolutionary if ever there was, scored his own surprise win at Dubienka. The Russian advance, though stunted in the south, wasn't actually stopped, and unfortunately for Poniatowski, the time he and his soldiers had purchased with their blood did not see more defences produced in time to prevent a collapse of the northern front in Lithuania. Warsaw was on the verge of being captured as King Stanislav pleaded in vain for peace. Catherine was deaf to her former lover's pleas. In fact, she was now emboldened to inflict a far more crushing blow than she had hoped to when the war began, as Prussia and Austria both signalled their willingness to side with Russia, if only they were given a slice of Poland in the peace. The Commonwealth capitulated on July 27th. Russian, Austrian and Prussian troops marched to borders staked out in secret negotiations in St. Petersburg. In January 1793, the partition went into effect. The vast region around the Polish city of Poznan went to Prussia. Austria smoothed out a couple of lingering quibbles in Bohemia. And for herself and Russia, Catherine carved out the lion's share. The entirety of Belarus, western Ukraine, and eastern Lithuania. A total area of 212,000 square kilometres. Only on threat of execution did a rump session of the Sam convene, under Catherine's auspices, in the Lithuanian city of Grodno. Even then it took three months and a battery of Russian cannons pointed at the meeting hall to convince the Sion to accede to the second partition. In the wave of persecution that followed from the Russian occupation, many Polish patriots like Kosciuszko fled to France. There they meshed well with the Jacobins of the National Convention, whose model of uncompromising revolutionary government in a time of national crisis inspired a generation of Polish radicals. Back in Poland, the situation remained dire. Though Stanislav remained king, Russia was in full control of the Commonwealth and acted ruthlessly to suppress the Patriot movement. Tensions boiled over in February 1794 with a wave of arrests of prominent Patriots. The city of Krakow rose in rebellion and raised a ragtag army of national defence. Many Patriots returned to join the rebellion, among them Kosciuszko, by now a confirmed Jacobin. Inspiring and courageous, Kosciuszko put his name to the revolt that now swept Poland. He led a force of recruits to victory near Raklavice. A sympathetic revolt then broke out in Warsaw, led by Jan Kalinski, another radical Jacobin. Kalinski's revolt saw Warsaw erupt into a two-day rolling battle. Thousands of civilians were killed before the Russian army was forced to withdraw. Lithuania too rose in revolt under Jakob Jasinski, yet another Jacobin. The fact that the Polish uprising had such a prominent Jacobin character gave many former patriots pause. They were concerned that Kosciuszko and others might emulate the French to form their own committee of public safety, rather than defer to the Siem. Kosciuszko's Polaniec Manifesto, promising emancipation for the Serbs, also isolated landowners who would otherwise have been sympathetic. Despite his own reservations, King Stanislav was on board. However, he could offer nothing but moral support since the state was entirely bankrupt. Despite this, the Polish uprising was quickly evolving into the Polish Revolution. A revolutionary France and a revolutionary Poland were intolerable for the partitioners of Poland, so Prussia and Russia jointly organised an invasion. Krakow fell to the Prussians in June, Vilnius to the Russians in August. Before long, Russians and Prussians were besieging Warsaw, where Kosciuszko was dug in with 40,000 troops. Resistance was fierce, and the proud city refused to yield. For two months, Warsaw held, but it was only a matter of time before the enemy broke through. But then, in late August, Henryk Dabrowski popped up in Poznan and raised the city and its surrounds in revolt. Gathering what he could of the Polish army, he then marched not to the relief of Warsaw, but into Pomerania and Prussia, routing enemy detachments as he went. The Prussians were forced to withdraw from Warsaw to secure their rear, and the Russians too quit the siege. For as daring as Dabrowski's attack was, it only bought Poland a few more weeks of life. Austria joined the war and Russia renewed the attack with vigour. Marshal Suvorov, who had once before put the boot into Poland, now returned. 
At Maciejowice, the Polish army was annihilated, with Kosciuszko himself captured in the fighting. Warsaw fell to Suvorov only a few weeks later in November. In revenge against the city which had refused to yield, the Russians inflicted a bloody slaughter. Patriots who had stayed behind were executed en masse, and the Warsaw Jewish community, a bastion of support for Polish independence, were massacred or exiled. This genocidal campaign was then visited upon the rest of Poland wherever Russian troops tread, making the Austrian and Prussian occupations look mild by contrast. The zones of occupation had been carefully planned by the three powers. Lithuania in the east went to Russia, southern Poland to Austria, and the Polish heartlands to Prussia. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth had ceased to exist. Those who could flee did. Emigres fled to Great Britain, Sweden, the United Provinces, even the United States of America in their droves. But it was as ever in France that the Polish expatriates found a lasting welcome. Here the revolutionary government supported both in principle and in practice Poland's right to exist, and the surest way to return Poland to the map of Europe was to seize it back from the enemies of both France and Poland. With Kosciuszko imprisoned by the Russians, it was left to other prominent revolutionaries to take up the slack. In 1797, the first of the Polish legions was formed at the insistence of Henryk Dabrowski. The scheme gained support from the French government and then General Napoleon Bonaparte. Poles in French service and the many Eastern European peoples captured as prisoners from the defeated Austrian army were formed into their own units. Donning French uniforms but Polish insignia, the first Polish legion formed the nucleus of the army of the Cisalpine and later the Italian Republic, based out of Milan. Two more legions would follow the first Polish legion. The second Polish legion was formed in 1798 under Józef Zajonczyk. Two years later, in 1800, the famed Legion of the Vistula was formed under Karol Kinaziewicz. Just as the French soldiers sang La Marseillaise, the Polish legionaries sang their own patriotic song, Dabrowski's Mazurka, which gives us the famous refrain, Poland is not yet lost. Indeed, Poland was not yet lost so long as there were those willing to fight for its restoration. However, the spirit of unity known in years past evaporated and no two Polish expats agreed on how to go about winning back their homes. Generally, the more radical, republican, and oftentimes Jacobin members of the Polish Revolution saw salvation in France. By contrast, the moderate constitutionalists and monarchists were not so gung-ho. Some were willing to wait out the storm, biding their time, while others aimed to work with the Austrians, the Prussians, and the Russians to achieve some measure of self-rule. The Polish Patriot movement had thus fractured into three distinct groupings, each with a nominal figurehead. Like most of his contemporaries, Adam Sartorsky was captured and sent to St. Petersburg after 1794. Here, he became friendly with a young Duke Alexander, with whom he shared a passion for the principles of the Enlightenment. When Alexander inherited the Russian throne in 1801, he appointed Sartorsky as his Minister of Foreign Affairs. Unlike the usual gaggle of idiots surrounding the Tsar, Tsiartorsky offered solid advice and counsel, which Alexander appreciated. As we've seen, Russian foreign policy towards France was very on-again, off-again in the years leading up to 1805 and the disastrous Battle of Austerlitz. Through it all, Tsiartorsky never neglected Polish issues. He used the goodwill he built up to secure limited self-government for Russia's Polish territories and saw Alexander's approval for future self-rule. At the polar opposite end of the scale, not caring a whit about what the Tsar thought, was Tadeusz Kosciuszko. Dispossessed and exiled after the revolution, Kosciuszko settled with friends in the United States, though he did keep a close eye on developments out of France. When he got word that France had formed Polish legions, Kosciuszko rushed back to France only to find that the situation was quite different than what he'd been led to believe. The legions were there to augment French forces, not spearhead the restoration of the Commonwealth. In contrast to Siartorsky's pragmatism and Kosciuszko's hard-edged radicalism, Prince Joseph Poniatowski, son and heir of King Stanislav, opted for a wait-and-see approach. After the Third Partition, Stanislav had been prisoner of the Russians in St. Petersburg, where he died in 1798. Afterwards, Joseph was not only the leader of his family, but also the King of Poland. Of course, this royal title existed in name only. After being dispossessed of his family's lands for leading the 1794 revolution, Poniatowski was a king without a kingdom. 
Nonetheless, he remained the focal point for Polish patriots and reformers, despite being far from an ideal candidate. Though a brave soldier, in these times of peace, he was content to live life one grand ball at a time. Exiled to Austria, he quickly integrated into Viennese high society. Poniatowski only returned to Poland in 1806 to become the mayor of Warsaw at the request of the Prussians, who needed a popular figurehead to quell their rebellious eastern territories. And that brings us neatly back around to Napoleon, because it was in response to the looming war with France that Prussia called on Poniatowski. Napoleon's own views on Poland and Polish nationhood were complicated to say the least. He could fluctuate between being a sympathetic ally to a harsh opponent. It's hard to pin down his precise thoughts, only that they changed throughout his life depending on circumstances at the time. Throughout his early career as a general, Napoleon appears to have shared the sympathy for Poles common among French revolutionaries. He was, after all, instrumental in the formation of the Polish legions, for which he was widely acclaimed. It wasn't until his consulship that Napoleon's opinion hardened. Deputations from the Polish legions, Dobrovsky especially, implored Napoleon to adopt Poland's independence as a French foreign policy objective. For diplomatic reasons, this was unacceptable to Napoleon. Prussia, Russia and Austria were at various times enemies, to be sure, but they were also at peace often enough, and stoking resentment by pushing Polish independence was a surefire way to scupper any lasting peace. There was also the more practical issue that an independent Poland would see the Polish legions dissolve. These were useful military assets for Napoleon, but the Polish legions only existed so long as Poland didn't, so he strung along the Polish patriots, extolling their virtues, meeting delegations, but never committing, never promising anything more than friendship. It was the squandering of the legions in fruitless pursuits not linked to Polish, but purely French interests, that lost Napoleon the support of the radical patriots. Many were profoundly disillusioned as Napoleon dispatched Polish units in the failed conquest of Haiti in 1802. For his part, Kosciuszko had years before seen through Napoleon's Poland policy. In a personal meeting in 1799, he'd been disgusted by the First Consul's dithering. Further disappointment followed in 1804, with Napoleon's coronation and founding of the empire. Still, the tantalising promise of independence was irresistible for some Polish patriots. Many remained with Kosciuszko and committed to their republican principles, but more than a few, like Dabrowski, shared idealism in furtherance of the dream of Poland. Through thick and thin, he and other patriots would fight for France in expectation that it was the only realistic path to independence. Dream became reality when, in 1807, Poland was liberated village by village, town by town, until Warsaw itself was free. The question now was what came next. For starters, a full restoration of the Commonwealth, a goal of only the most idealistic of the radicals, was immediately off the table. Representing radical opinion, Kosciuszko had written back to Napoleon earlier in the year to demand the Siem be restored along with the Commonwealth. But even though Napoleon invited Kosciuszko to join this project, he had no desire to liberate Poland, only to then hand it over to the magnates and Schlachter, who would no doubt quickly return to the obstinate parochialism that had gotten them into this mess. A far firmer hand was required. The Napoleonic choice then might have been pretty obvious. Pick a brother or other family member and make them ruler. This would solve the problem of governance by making Poland a monarchy and also put the new state firmly under Napoleon's thumb. Jérôme was right there in Volhynia, after all. But were it so easy? To pick a family member almost certainly would have failed in the long term. As it was, the Polish aristocracy were deeply sceptical and had not yet thrown their full support behind the French. For some, this was a simple economic calculation. Napoleon had abolished serfdom and feudalism wherever he went, and it seemed Poland would be no different. Others were more reticent to let Napoleon take another crown for himself or his family. Rather than keep these opinions concealed, the nobles were far from coy and let the emperor have an earful. It was communicated that in order to be given reliable aristocratic support, there would be a price to pay. Only a Pole could lead Poland. In a letter to Marat, Napoleon described his decision to acquiesce. The Poles, who show so much prudence, who ask for so many conditions before declaring themselves for me, are egotists who cannot be kindled to enthusiasm for love of their country. I am old in my knowledge of men. My greatness does not rest on a few thousand Poles. It is for them to take advantage of the present circumstances with enthusiasm. It is not for me to take the first step. 
There were three candidates for the Polish throne. The first was Adam Siatorski, who, as son of Kazimierz Siatorski, was technically a prince. On the other hand, he was the foreign minister for Tsar Alexander and the architect of Russia's hostility to France for the past decade, so not ideal. Another candidate was Friedrich August von Wettin, the King of Saxony. Now, having just been at war with France, fighting alongside the Prussians, Napoleon was not going to offer the Polish throne to the king on a silver platter. Instead, he used the chance as a diplomatic carrot to coax Saxony out of its alliance with Prussia. On the off chance that he might be made king of Poland, just like his Vettin predecessors, Friedrich August recanted the alliance with Prussia and even joined the Confederation of the Rhine. Still, the Poles weren't about to welcome a Saxon back on the throne after years of Prussian rule. So that left only Joseph Poniatowski as the logical pick for the top job. He was a prince, already in Warsaw, well-liked and a proven soldier. Napoleon agreed he was the right choice, albeit with some reservations. I know Poniatowski better than you do, Marat, because I have followed Polish affairs these last 10 years. He is even more flighty than the average Pole, which is saying a great deal. He is not much trusted in Warsaw. All the same, he is a man with whom to keep on good terms. On December 19th, a provisional Polish government had been formed in Warsaw when Napoleon first passed through, Marat nominally in charge. Napoleon now declared in January that Poniatowski would take over. Polish patriots flocked to positions in the army, administration and diplomatic corps, eager to rebuild their nation. Eleven years after its final partition, Poland was finally returned to the map of Europe, though its government, its leadership and its future was far from resolved. Poland was but one iron in the fire. Other pressing matters required Napoleon's attentions elsewhere. Diplomatic overtures made in the latter weeks of 1806 were now coming to fruition. Back in November and December of 1806, Sultan Selim III of the Ottoman Empire had been offered assurances of French support if he wished to put down his wayward Wallachian and Moldavian vassals. This would embroil the Ottoman Empire in a war with the Russians, who guaranteed Wallachia and Moldavia as fellow Orthodox principalities. Fresh from victory at Jena, Napoleon assured Selim that he was Russia's sole focus. Now was the time to strike. And so Selim did. On December 22nd, he declared war, invading Wallachia and Moldavia. Horace Sebastiani, Napoleon's eyes and ears at the sublime port, reported on a fierce zeal to clash with the Russians. But after initial successes, Ottoman troops were bogged down by Mikhail Miloradovich. The French plan had gone off without a hitch. Russian troops tied up in the Balkans were Russian troops not campaigning in Poland. And as if one secondary front was not enough, Napoleon also made a play to keep Persia and Russia at each other's throats. In 1804, Fatih Ali, Shah of Persia, declared war on Russia over territorial disputes in the Caucasus. Two years of fighting had not gone well for the Shah. And after what is today Georgia and Azerbaijan fell to the Russians, he was ready to call it quits. In came an offer from Napoleon for a small but well-equipped expeditionary force of about 4,000 troops and 50 cannon. For as long as this offer existed, the Shah could hold out hope of turning the tide, and Napoleon could keep yet more Russian troops away from Poland. Evidently, between three simultaneous wars on three separate fronts, Tsar Alexander had bitten off more than he could chew, and was paying the price. Though the Ottomans and Persians could be contained with relatively small numbers of troops, to beat the French required much, much more. Equipping and paying for new units was putting a severe strain on the Russian treasury. Through intermediaries, Alexander begged for six million pounds and military supplies from Prime Minister William Grenville. The Tsar was rebuffed because Britain's treasury was in crisis too, facing the dual pressures of a weak pound and mounting war expenses in South America. After much wrangling, Britain did not agree to a new subsidy program, only a brief spell of financial aid. Just £420,000 found its way to St. Petersburg, along with 60,000 muskets. The money sent initially was around half a million, but the Swedes confiscated £80,000 on the way as a recompense for their pathetic efforts in Strassland. Even the Prussians, reduced to just East Prussia, were given a mere £200,000, not enough to do anything remotely useful. So switching gears, Alexander then turned to the Austrians, arguing that if they joined the war, there'd be some real oomph behind the Fourth Coalition, even without British support. If Poland was liberated by the French, would not this new Poland seek to reclaim all their lost lands, including Austrian Volhynia? Despite these claims having a ring of truth, it was too much and too fast for Vienna. Napoleon, of course, had anticipated Austria's involvement, 
and pre-positioned armies in key positions, but more importantly they were not ready for war, as the Austrian army was undergoing extensive reforms and modernisation. Britain really was the linchpin here. Had Grenville agreed to open up the taps, it's possible Austria might have reconsidered, and Russia would have had the resources to wage a successful war. Short on friends and funds, Alexander was in the market for a miracle. Quick to respond was General Bennigsen. At a council of war held in Novgorod on January 2nd, he proposed a bold plan for a winter counterattack rather than a static defence. Realising that he was not cut out for this sort of work, Timid Kaminskoy resigned his command. Bennigsen took his place and with abounding energy, set about preparing the offensive. Bucks Herbden's army was stripped for reinforcements for Bennigsen's main army. Le Turc's 13,000 remaining Prussians would also join him for a grand total of 76,000 coalition troops. The plan of attack was to strike at the thinly held French line along the Ozic, around Niedenburg and Yanova, driving a wedge between Ney's corps and Marat's cavalry reserve. The goal was less to create an opportunity for exploitation come the thaw, but more to inflict a disproportionate damage on Marat's units, which Benigsen believed to be in very poor condition. On that count, he was right on the money. The paralyzing effects of mud and snow prevented adequate resupply for French troops, manning the Nara Vistula line. For less than scrupulous French commanders, this shortfall was made up by raiding into the rear lines to take supplies destined for other French units. Unfortunately, in this contest, there had to be a loser, and that loser was Marat. Most of his light cavalry, which might have defended his own convoys, were positioned on the northern side of the defensive line to act as pickets. So critical was the supply situation for Marat that on July 2nd, the same day as the Russian Council of War, he defied Napoleon's orders and sent his entire force to scour the countryside north of the Omulev River for anything that wasn't nailed down. The Missourian lakelands were well stocked for winter, so Marat was pleased to see his boys returning with sacks of grain and hay borne on the backs of their mounts. Less than pleased was Napoleon, who was rudely awoken from his reverie with Madame Valevska to find that an entire operation had been launched without his authorization, let alone his knowledge. On January 4th, Napoleon politely but firmly requested a report on, quote, the state of the reserve cavalry. More of the emperor's requests for clarification followed in the next few days, but either because the weather was bad and the roads often impassable, or because he didn't want to face the music, Marat never responded to adequately. Before the matter could come to a head, Bennigsen launched his offensive. With half the French reserve cavalry out foraging and raiding, he advanced in near total secrecy through the Bialoverja forest then known as the Johannesburg Forest. It wasn't until some of the Russian units strayed a bit further south, running into the pickets of Ney's corps, that the full scale of the offensive was uncovered. The French response was immediate and practiced. Surmising quickly that Bennigsen's purpose was to drive a wedge between the defending French corps, Napoleon decided to leverage Russian momentum against them. As they marched westwards, deeper into hostile territory, Napoleon would spring a trap launching a pincer attack to surround and destroy Bennigsen's army. To begin, Bernadotte and Ney gave ground, drawing the Russians in. The advance guard of the Russian army under Evgeny Markov clashed inconclusively with Bernadotte at the Battle of Morag on January 25th. Time was bought for the French reserve corps to assemble at pre-ranged rallying points, this assembly being accomplished astonishingly fast considering the adversity of winter weather. On January 28th, Davout, Soule and Augereau were ready for the off, their target the city of Allenstein. Taking Allenstein would cut off Benningsen's supply lines and make him vulnerable to Bernadotte and Ney who would about face and crush the Russian army. Departing Warsaw the same day, making for the small town of Shashnish, Napoleon personally oversaw the final preparations for the offensive, which now consisted mainly of coordinating the many corps and divisions. The sheer volume of letters, reports and correspondence that passed through Napoleon's staff at this time was unprecedented. Chief of Staff Louis-Alexandre Berthier strained his immense capacities just trying to keep things straight, but it was inevitable that some mistake would slip past. On January 30th, a fresh-faced graduate from the École Militaire was entrusted with a full copy of Napoleon's plan, which was to be delivered in person to Marshal Bernadotte. On the road, the young messenger was waylaid by roving Cossacks, who captured the documents and forwarded them to Bennigsen. At once he realised the danger his army was in, and so rather than continue with the attack, Bennigsen reconcentrated his force at Ayankovo to the north. When the French counteroffensive opened on February 1st, it was not known that the plan was already compromised, that Bennigsen, far from falling into Napoleon's trap, 
was laying one of his own. When Marat arrived in Allenstein the next day, he found nothing and no one. The town was abandoned. This was not what Napoleon had expected. It was a worrying portent, but one he ignored as the three attacking corps occupied Ortelsburg, with the Imperial Guard remaining in reserve. Napoleon was now of the opinion that Gutstadt, far to the north, not Allenstein, must be where the bulk of Benningsen's force was amassed. Marat and Sul pushed straight for the town, screened on their eastern flank by the Polish lakes, and Ney on their left flank. Augereau and the Imperial Guard followed in reserve. At this stage, the pace of the advance, complicated by the weather, left Napoleon out of contact with the forward elements of the corps. From Arlenstein, he struggled to get a good picture of what was happening, of where the Russians were, of the weather and conditions. He expected a battle soon, but it would not be one of his time nor place of choosing. Seven miles to the northwest of Arlenstein, the small village of Ironkovo, cannon fire broke the silence of a still morning. Ney's corps had stumbled into a sizable detachment of the Russian army, which had quit their retreat to deliver a backhand blow. After being repulsed by the initial fusillade, Ney regrouped by midday, aided by Marat's cavalry screen. Without recourse to Napoleon or a carefully charted plan of attack, Marat opted for the tried and true method of a double envelopment. The divisions of Ney's corps advanced on Iron Corvo, joined by a single division under Louis Le Grand from Soule's 4th. They found the Russians well positioned, their left flank secured by marshlands and right flank abutting onto Ionkovo itself. A frontal attack was all that was possible. The French divisions rolled onwards, peppered by artillery and skirmisher fire. But once they closed the distance and crashed into the enemy line, Russian morale was skewered on the business end of French bayonets. Only an early nightfall prevented Ney and Marat from advancing further, not that they needed to bother. Sul's corps was meant to use the day to steal around the rear of the Russian line and sever their line of retreat at Bark Veda. That was the plan. As it transpired, holding the bridge in town was a full division under Nikolai Kaminskoy, the son of the disgraced Marshal Kaminskoy. Proving he had the metal his father lacked, Nikolai held Bark Veda tenaciously, repelling repeated French assaults. Nearing dusk, two of Sul's regiments did capture the bridge, and it seemed their battle was won. But just before night fell, Kaminskoy counterattacked, using the frozen over river to his advantage. So despite a valiant effort, Sul wasn't able to close the bridge. This meant that the battered Russian units from Iron Kova were able to flee northwards untouched. Kaminskoy followed right behind them all the way to Gutstadt. For a few hundred losses, Napoleon had nearly ensnared two Russian divisions, or 20 to 30,000 soldiers. Unfortunately, nearly is the operative word here. Reality set in on the morning of February 4th, as it became clear Bark Veda had been abandoned in the night. Left behind was the entire Russian baggage train containing food, ammunition and clothing, which provided some consolation to the shivering, hungry French soldiers. Their situation, however, had not fundamentally improved, and indeed had been made that much worse now that their main supply base at Pultursk was dozens of miles to the rear. The only way out was through, and so they turned on the 4th towards the pursuit. Marat and Sul struck for Landsberg, De Vu for Heilsburg, and Ney for Vomdit. At Hof on February 5th, another brief battle unfurled. The Russians formed a defensive line into which the French charged. Close fighting ensued amidst driving snows, 2,000 killed and wounded on both sides. Hof was a bitter taste of what was in store only a few miles north at Ai Lau. The town of Ai Lau lay on the eastern slope of a string of hills, which overlooked fields crisscrossed by streams and dotted by forests and bogs. Marat's cavalry pursued the fleeing elements of Kaminskoy to the outskirts of Ailau on the morning of February 7th. Without artillery or infantry to take the town, Marat paused until reinforcements arrived. Sul, Augereau and the Imperial Guard duly appeared on the scene that afternoon. As night came, so too did foul weather, wind and snow buffeting the 45,000 French troops as they huddled on the western side of the Ailau hills. From atop one of these peaks at Ziegelhof, Napoleon studied his maps trying to ascertain the whereabouts of the other corps. Reports from that day suggested that ahead of him at Ailau was Benningsen's entire army, or about 60 to 65,000 Russian troops. The Prussians, Napoleon knew, were absent. Ney was tailing them, aiming to prevent a conjunction. However, since the Russians were here, and outnumbered the French, Napoleon needed all the reinforcements he could get. The Vu and Ney's corps were to be recalled as soon as possible, weather permitting. Bernadotte was too far away, 
having only received his orders late owing to the mishap with the intercepted messenger on February 1st. In consequence, he had only started his attack on February 3rd, and so was two days from Ailao. It's in this context that a brief controversy brews, because from his command tent, Napoleon and his staff were alarmed to hear the crackle of gunfire amidst the howling wind. As it had transpired, Napoleon's own household staff had found itself in a pickle. A cart laden with the imperial kitchen and all of Napoleon's personal effects appeared to trundle into town without a worry in the world. Russian pickets barked warnings, which were answered in French, and then replied to in turn with musketry. A couple of Sewell's troops closest to the action raced to the aid of the household staff, engaging in a rolling skirmish at the entrance to Ailao. Seeing this, the Russian commanders on scene ordered forward a force of infantry and cavalry, believing that this was the beginning of a nighttime attempt to seize the town. The French on scene commanders, in turn, called their own reinforcements from Arras Division. The whole situation escalated rapidly from there. Before Sewell could put a stop to it, his divisions were feeding troops into the fight until thousands of soldiers were engaged hand to hand, street to street, in a bloody melee. Morning revealed the carnage on the streets. Hundreds had died during the night. The steep death toll is about the only uncontested fact about the night of February 7th. I presented what is agreed to be the most likely of explanations, but there are others. One posits that Napoleon ordered a nighttime attack against the wishes of his officers because he believed his troops would be better off spending the night indoors. It's also argued that he underestimated Russian numbers in the town and sent troops forward into the unknown. The problem with this theory, however, is that there was never an order to this effect though admittedly it could have been destroyed. Circumstantial, however, exonerates Napoleon. A Captain Malbeau of Augereau's staff recalled that Napoleon declared he was averse to night fighting, saying as much on the night of the 7th. At the same time, he was not squeamish about leaving troops exposed to the elements when needs must. Besides, Napoleon was awaiting reinforcements from Davout and Ney, still possibly days out, and did not want to trigger Bennigsen into attacking before he was at numerical parity. And with all that said, Napoleon was in charge, and should perhaps have expected that something like this was possible, and so issued orders not to escalate skirmishes. Not that it would have guaranteed nothing went wrong, but it might have forestalled Saul and Marat's tendency to act first and ask forgiveness later. No matter how it came to be, the French were in possession of Ailao come the morning of February 8th. The town itself was occupied by Saul's corps of three divisions, under Claude Legrand, Jean-Francois Leval, and Louis-Vincent Saint-Hilaire. To the south of Ailao, around an old cemetery, was Augereau's corps, consisting of two infantry divisions, the first under Jacques Desjardins, the second under Etienne Houdelet. Venturing a bit further out onto the fields was the full panoply of divisional artillery, now training their sights on the enemy. On the right flank, screening Augereau, was Marat's reserve cavalry, consisting of light, medium and heavy cavalry divisions. Etienne Nansouti was ill, so his cuirassier division was commanded in person by Marat. Nearby, the 2nd Cuirassier Division was led by steely Jean-Joseph de Peul. Leading the 1st Dragoon Division was Dominique Klein, the 2nd Dragoon Division, Emmanuel Grouchy, and the 3rd, Marc-Antoine Beaumont. The Light Cavalry, so all of the Hussar, the Chasseurs à Cheval, and the Lancers, were split into two divisions, one under Edouard Miller, and the other under Antoine Lassalle. In reserve was the Imperial Guard, as ever. However, since Lefebvre was away leading 10th Corps, command of both the infantry and cavalry of the guards deferred to Jean-Baptiste Bessier. Napoleon himself did not stay with the guard as he often did, but went into Eilau town to get a better view. He took up a perch in the spire of the town church, a spyglass and map close to hand. Day broke, but the weather did not. Furious snowstorms peeled across the town and its outlying villages. Only in gaps between gusts of wind and snow could Napoleon and his officers catch a glimpse of the enemy from atop their vantage point. The Russian line spanned from Schlodaiten in the north to Anklappen in the east, from where it kinked southwards along a frozen stream towards Zerpalen. Anklappen was the linchpin of the line and where most of the artillery and reserve cavalry were stationed. This area was mostly farmland, so most of the Russian line was out in the open and densely packed. But more than a few units, especially in the south, enjoyed the concealment and protection of thick forest. From right to left, the Russian commanders were Evgeny Markov, Nikolai Tuchkov, Dmitry Doktorov, Fabian Osten Sakin, Nikolai Kaminskoy, and finally Alexander Osterman Tolstoy. Tuchkov was in overall command of the right flank, Sakin the centre, and Tolstoy the left. 
Given the numerical superiority of the Russian force and their inferior position on the low ground, Napoleon expected that Bennigsen would attack first. This could be devastating. If allowed to attack at will, Napoleon could not be sure he'd hold long enough for Davout or Ney to arrive, leaving them to be picked off in detail. The French had to attack first in order to buy time. The hastily formed plan called for a double envelopment. Sul would open the battle by advancing out of Eilau towards Tuchkov on the Russian right. His job would be to engage Tuchkov directly or entice him to attack. Either way, it would hopefully encourage Bennigsen to counterattack from his left flank towards Sul in the center. At this point, Augereau and the reserve cavalry would strike the Russian left, aiming to sever it from the center. With a bit of luck, enough time will have been bought for Ney to arrive from the northwest, and Davu from the southeast. Surrounded now on all sides, their lines sundered and exposed, the Russians would be dealt a crushing defeat. In a gap in the snowstorm at around 8am, the Russians opened the battle with artillery fire. Bang on target, the fusillade tore into Ai Lao for about half an hour. Roofs were torn from buildings by a round shot, while the shells from mortars and howitzers set their insides aflame. Despite being right in the midst of the fusillade, the French troops had good cover in the buildings or in the contours of the hillside, keeping casualties to a minimum. It wasn't long before the French guns returned fire, targeting not so much the Russian guns so much as the exposed lines of Russian infantry. As Red Hot shot landed home, bloody gaps appeared in densely packed formations where moments before soldiers had stood. Hundreds of Russian troops were killed, hundreds more wounded. Cannon fire from both sides slackened as the snowstorm billowed with a renewed intensity at about 8.30. Taking advantage, Sul was ordered forward with La Salle in support on his left. Like an avalanche, the French divisions flowed from the hillside, marching in perfect order. For the first time in weeks, morale was good. Neither cold nor cannon fire could stop them from singing. It was a sublime sight, and not one that escaped the eyes of Tuchkov. Once Sul passed the 600 metre mark, Tuchkov's divisions began to reel and push. French divisions stopped where they were to repel the massive attack, ad hoc defensive position formed from whatever was to hand. Antoine de Val, for instance, occupied some of the only high ground in the area at Windmill Hill, and established a battery overlooking the frozen marches and fields from where Tuchkov attacked. Fire poured from the French line, scything down row after row of Russian infantry. Still they advanced, stepping over the bodies of the fallen. Return fire assailed the French line too, but the snowstorm blanketing the battlefield reduced visibility, limiting the usefulness of artillery. For the moment, this was a gunfight between French and Russian fusiliers. All the way to the southeast, after a few hours' delay, Louis Friant's division hoved into sight. He was the first part of Davout's Third Corps to arrive in the battle. Catching a lucky break, Tolstoy spotted Friant's division forming up. He dispatched cavalry under General Bagavut on an attack. Tired from the march and not expecting action so soon, Friant's division suffered unduly against Cossacks and Hussars. It was far from a defeat for the French, and Friant's division formed square as quick as they could, but it was still a nasty welcome to Eilau. So far, the battle was developing mostly to Napoleon's design. The worry at this stage was Sul. How long could he hold as the pressure mounted? From 8.30 to 9am, Tuchkov suffered terrible losses, but did make painstaking progress against Sul. Windmill Hill held like a rock against the tide, but the rest of the divisions had to make a fighting withdrawal. Seeing the pressure Sul was under, Napoleon toyed with the idea of pulling him back. To do so, however, would be to undo the plan. So instead, Napoleon ordered Augereau and Marat to attack now at 9.30am, even though it was much earlier than planned. So it was that 7th Corps advanced. At first, everything went well. The snowstorm obscured the French from sight, meaning that they suffered little from cannon fire and musketry. This cover was, however, a double-edged sword, for while the French were obscured from the Russians, they were also obscured from each other. Contact between the divisions broke down until nobody on the ground was sure where the hell they were. At 10am, as though a switch were flipped, the snowstorm abated, visibility was restored, and the French realised how screwed they were. Augereau had blundered straight into the Russian centre. Sarkin's cannoneers wasted no time in opening fire at what was point-blank range. Grapeshot and shell exploded among the French infantry. Musket fire rained down too. In only a few minutes, hundreds died, then hundreds more, then thousands. The snow ran red with French blood. 
stunned, disorganized, and suffering mind-boggling losses, Ozro's corps was helpless as Sakan attacked with infantry. Dokhtarov's division led the attack, overrunning and annihilating entire French units. Regiments which had fought for Napoleon since 1804, for France since 1789 or even earlier, simply ceased to be. Osro issued an order for a general retreat, but in the confusion, the 14th Regiment of the Line did not receive these orders. As the Russians cascaded down around them, the 14th held against repeated attacks, though it would only be a matter of time before they were completely destroyed. By now, Osro had reformed a defensive line near his starting positions at the Eilau Cemetery. Messengers were sent forth to recall the 14th, first one, then two, then a dozen more. None made it through. All were killed. Only Captain Marbeau managed to get through, making contact with Colonel Henriot. I can see no way of saving the regiment, said Henriot. Return to the Emperor and give the farewells of the 14th Regiment of the Line, which has faithfully carried out his orders. Before he rode away, Marbeau was also given the 14th's Eagle Standard. A soldier had tried to snap the eagle from its perch on the staff, but to no avail. So as Marbeau began to gallop away, he made an obvious target. Surrounded by Russian infantry, he was bayoneted and the eagle standard captured. Marbeau's sacrifice proved in vain. Some of the survivors of the 14th did manage to fight their way back to the French line, though two-thirds of the regiment lay dead or dying out on the snow. At about the same time as Sakhan ordered Doctor of Forward, the younger Kaminskoy was put on the attack too. Exhausted after their gruelling two-hour duel with Tuchkov on the left, Sul's corps was vulnerable as Kaminskoy's frontal attack plunged deep into Eilau town. By 11am they'd completely broken through and were on the verge of overriding it entirely. At one point, Napoleon and his staff were isolated from the rest of the army, surrounded by Kaminskoy's troops. Had it not been for the efforts of the Imperial Guard, Napoleon almost certainly would have been killed or captured. His personal bodyguard fought doggedly, bravely, buying just enough time for two battalions of the Imperial Guard Grenadiers to intercede. Napoleon might have been saved, but the battle was not. Augereau and Sul were buckling in the centre. Ney and Davu were still hours away, and the Russians were still steamrolling forwards. To stem the tide, Napoleon called on Marat. He was ordered to make an immediate charge, to sweep the Russians from Eilau, and then press on as far as possible into the Russian centre. If successful, it would give Napoleon a chance to address his lines, and Davout and Ney more time. At 11.30am, the cavalry reserve set off at a trot. The trot gave way to a canter, and before long, a full gallop. 10,000 cavalrymen, cuirassiers, hussars, lancers, and dragoons, charged in two massed columns, slicing, dicing, and rending a swath through the Russian line. The impact was devastating. Gun batteries were overrun, the cannon spiked, Infantry regiments tumbled back in terror. After sundering the Russian line at two points, Marat's cavalry reeled inwards to form a single column, which then charged back the way it had come. The Russians had not expected this. Squares thrown up to halt the second charge were simply washed away, so irresistible was French momentum. Watching the unfolding carnage carefully, Napoleon now judged at the right time to unleash a second wave of cavalry. This wave consisted of the Guard cavalry all under the command of Bessières. As they were reeling into position, the second wave began to take fire. The horsemen of the Grenadier à Cheval took heart at reassurance from their commander, Colonel Le Pic. Quote, Keep your heads up, boys. They're shooting bullets, not shit. When the second wave charged, meeting Marat halfway, what lingered of Kaminskoy and Dokhtarov's divisions was destroyed. A huge gap had therefore formed in the centre of the Russian line one that forced Bennigsen to shorten his frontage to cover it. By 1245, therefore, fighting died down as the French cavalry retired and the Russians reformed. Augereau and Sul were in no condition to advance, and despite the freshness of the Imperial Guard, Napoleon was still unwilling to commit his reserve. Thus, the day's battle, already so hard fought, was far from over. De Vaux by now had arrived in full, joining saint Hilaire's division already in place in the south. With Ney still a few hours away, Napoleon now wanted to roll up the Russian line from the south so that when Ney arrived from the north, he could deliver the killing blow. At 1pm, Davout's attack commenced. For two hours, he made excellent progress. Benigsen was caught completely off guard as several of his regiments broke and ran. Had it not been for the timely arrival of Le Touc, the French might have clinched the win then and there. 
As it was though, after days of hard fighting, Le Tuk had managed to evade Ney to arrive on the battlefield from the north. He caught Davout's corps on the cusp of taking Anklappen. Le Tuk mustered his 9,000 troops and units of rallied Russians to counterattack Davout's exposed flank at Kutschitten. In less than an hour, all the progress Davout had made was erased as he fell back to starting positions. Despite Davout's defeat, this setback was far from fatal. What it did mean, however, was that Napoleon's offensive plan had failed. The Russian army, despite having suffered gravely, was intact, as indeed was the Prussian army. By 6pm the temperature was dropping and light dimming, but neither Napoleon nor Bennigsen were willing to pull up stakes, both believing that the battle could still be salvaged. With his last reserves of troops, Bennigsen launched assault columns against Sewell's position on the French left. The to and fro dragged on until 7pm when, from Altov in the north, Ney appeared. Though belated, Ney's arrival was a welcome sight. Sewell's corps fended off the Russian assault and aided Ney as he ejected the Russians from Schlodaten. But without a concentrated effort from the other French corps to pressure the rest of the Russian army, this was as far as Ney was able to get. Action ceased by 10pm as the Russians were driven back. From his command post at Anklappen, Bennigsen convened a council of war to decide on what to do next. His subordinate generals, Tuchkov, Kaminskoy and Tolstoy, all assured that come morning they could finish the French. After all, the Russians still had a numerical edge and were now reinforced by Litok's Prussians. Bennigsen, though, was of a different mind. He'd personally been at pretty well all the major flashpoints from the day's battle and knew how close things had come to disaster. Not wanting to risk handing Napoleon another bite at the apple, another chance to win, he elected to withdraw. By 3am, completely under French noses, the Russians were gone. The battlefield left behind was a scene of carnage and death on a gruesome scale. For 14 gruelling hours, the two finest armies in Europe had duked it out on the snow to terrible effect. Casualties for both sides vary quite a lot depending on the account you have to hand. Median sums put coalition losses at around 15,000 killed and wounded, of which maybe a thousand or so were Prussian. Though heavy, most of the Russian units had escaped intact as the French army was too tired to pursue. By contrast, the French had come off much, much worse than normal. Napoleon estimated around 4,000 losses, but in truth, between 20 to 25,000 French soldiers were casualties, of whom around a quarter were killed. Entire regiments had been destroyed and five eagles captured. Augereau's corps took the brunt, suffering 65% casualties, which included Jacques Desjardins, General of 1st Division. So severe were the losses that 7th Corps would soon be disbanded. Sewell's corps was mauled too, losing about half their starting strength. Marat's losses among the cavalry were relatively light, 10 to 15% of the 10,000 or so who started. Among the dead was one of the most seasoned cavalrymen in French service, Jean-Joseph Dotpol. He was peppered by grape shot during Marat's great big charge. From his hospital bed, he received a heartfelt letter from Napoleon, urging not to give up hope, to stay strong, so that he might see his son again. But the old soldier's wounds were too severe, and he died shortly afterwards. Dutpol's death was not the only personal blow for Napoleon. General Claude Corbineau, an aide-de-camp and friend, was killed during the day's fighting. Napoleon had singled out the promising young officer for high office in the future. Corbineau's untimely demise affected the emperor deeply. Another death worth mentioning is François Hinault, our letter-writing veteran from Pultusk. He was not present for the Battle of Ilau, instead dying in Warsaw on February 11th, of disease contracted sometime on campaign. It was only a month since riding home to his tender Rosalie. There can be no denying that the Battle of Ilau was a bittersweet victory for Napoleon. He'd won a narrow strategic victory, halting Benningsen's offensive, but only at the cost of about two-thirds of his starting force. Hairs can be split over whether or not this constitutes a defeat, a draw, or a narrow victory, but the feeling on the ground at the time was that this battle was indecisive. The French held the field at Ilau, but Bennigsen's force was intact and operational. Over the night, in morning of the 8th to the 9th of February, there was an expectation among the French army that the battle would resume the next morning. When it appeared that the Russians had retreated, a collective sigh of relief overcame the troops who had no more stomach for a fight. Napoleon claimed victory and led us back to Talleyrand, Cabasieres and Jérôme, though acknowledged that it was not gained without immense sacrifice. His angst over the day's battle shows in a letter he sent home to Josephine at 3am on February 9th. We have had a great battle yesterday. 
Victory is mine, but my losses are grave. The enemy's losses, which were greater, do not console me. I am writing to you these two lines to myself also, though I am very tired, simply to say that I am in good health and love you. To Tetois. Not long after writing this letter, Napoleon toured the battlefield alongside Marat and Soule. Augereau would have been there, but he'd suffered yet another wound during the battle. Turning to Soule, Napoleon admitted, quote, Marshal, the Russians have done us a great harm. And we to them, was Soule's reply. Our bullets are not made of cotton. Marat was less sanguine. Quel massacre est sans résultat. It was hard to argue with Marat that Eilau was a massacre without result. A layer of light snow had already covered the wreckage of the battle, but the carnage was plain to see. Blood, limbs, viscera littered the field. Men and horses dead where they fell. Abandoned guns and wagons. Battered corpses frozen into the ground, unable to be retrieved or buried. Nurses and medics combed the blood-stained snow following the groans of the wounded. The French medical corps, the Service de Santé, worked overtime to process all the wounded, numbering 15 to 20,000. Local Polish staff augmented the Germans, French, Italians and Dutch working in the field hospitals. Many lives were saved by these valiant efforts, though not enough to make the battle any less heart-wrenching for the French soldiers. After trudging through Poland, through mud, through snow, after watching friends and comrades dropping to disease and enemy action, and now suffering the most terrible single-day loss of life in the wars to date, the army's morale was shattered. No further action was possible. The troops demanded peace. It's no surprise then that a major propaganda effort to portray the Battle of Eilau as a victory began literally the day after the battle. On February 9th, the army bulletin gave cherry-picked highlights, special attention paid to morale's charge, which was, quote, covered in glory. Some snippets of the truth did slip through. Napoleon gave a somewhat frank retelling of Augereau's charge, which was described as veering off course into, quote, half an hour of darkness until rescued by Marat. All the soldiers could care for was the last line, quote, the army will be returned to cantonments and take up winter quarters. By the time the French public got a hold of the bulletin, word had already filtered back from letters and word of mouth that I allow was a bloodbath. To lie like a bulletin soon became a popular phrase in France. For as gruelling and as agonising as the Battle of Eilau had been, peace was still elusive. As long as Bennigsen was out there, Poland was not secure, and the Grand Armée's mission remained incomplete. Napoleon was still in search of his decisive, war-winning battle that would bring Tsar Alexander to terms and double as a chance to relitigate this close contest at Eilau. It'll take many more months of campaigning, a change of season, and plenty of ups and downs until Napoleon eventually finds that victory on the battlefield at Friedland. <laughs>